Before I had this shift, my perception of money centered around myself. I can't charge that because, well, would I pay that? And oh, I'm only worth X, Y, Z. When I finally understood that money is just a symbol that people use to express how they perceive value. Welcome to Plenty. I'm your host, Kate Northrup, and together we are going on a journey to help you have an incredible relationship with money, time, and energy, and to have abundance on every possible level. Every week, we're going to dive in with experts and insights to help you unlock a life of plenty. Let's go fill our cups. Please note that the opinions and perspectives of the guests on the Plenty podcast are not necessarily reflective of the opinions and perspectives of Kate Northrup or anyone who works within the Kate Northrup brand. Welcome to Plenty. I'm so excited for this episode and to introduce you to Makozi Najezer, who is the royal shaman. Makozi helps high achievers tap into ancient spiritual wisdom in a modern, practical way that resonates with people from all walks of life to create satisfaction success in the real world consciously. She's been featured by Business Insider, CBS, ABC, and more. Hi, Makosi. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I would love to get right in there and start from the moment you knew that you were operating on possibly a different channel than other folks, or maybe the vast majority of folks who, I don't know how you would describe it if you would say like, okay, I'll ask you this question before I before I land that question. Do you think that all of us have the capacity to be plugged in and connected and communicating on the level that you are? Or do you think specific, and that the, like most people are asleep? Or do you think specific people were brought here, like yourself, to be moving between worlds in the way that you do between the seen and the unseen? I think that spiritual gifts are kind of like any other kind of talent or skill that can be developed. So I think that there are people who have certain abilities and insights that are beyond what is like the norm, right? But everyone, or at least most people have some capacity. So the, the analogy that I like to use is like most of us can run barring if, unless you have, you know, a physical, um, disability, but most of us can run, but we're not all Usain Bolt. No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, no. and even if we tried, we couldn't all, all be. And I know that that's not the most popular thing to say in spiritual spaces and circles, but I think it's important that we all recognize where we have genius and also where we don't. And there are more places that I don't <laughs> than what I do. Yeah. But yeah. you have managed to build a very successful business around a super specific, in some people would call it fringy, set of spiritual gifts. So take me back to when those began to come online that you were aware of. Yeah, I, from very early childhood, was having experiences. It wasn't until I was maybe eight or nine and started to interact more with other kids mm. that I started to realize like, hmm, they're just, there's something different about me. So Pretty much my whole life, I've known I was weird. Um, <laughs> that's just what it is. But it was really in my, I would say the like the most drastic moment was at age 15 when um, my best friend was murdered. And she literally appeared at the end of my bed, just as plain as day as you are to me right now. And up until that point in my childhood, I had seen and experienced spirits and intuition and lots of knowingness, but it was that moment that I was like, oh, wow, um, <laughs> there's something real yeah. about this. Yeah. Did you grow up in a family where 
seeing and talking to spirits was part of what folks did? Or were you the only one who was doing this? Well, I now know that there were certain gifts, especially around dreams on my mother's side of the family, but I didn't know that that was a thing. So I grew up pretty involved in the church. I have pretty conservative family in all different aspects. I even have Amish Mennonite family members that I lived with for a couple years as a child. Wow. So this is not at all, I didn't have anyone to like talk to or could really understand what I was going through. So I just didn't share things. And I also was very intellectual as a kid. So I was like, I'm just going to focus on books and learning and education and like put all this kind of more spiritual stuff to the side. When your friend appeared to you at the end of her, your bed after her death, you've shared that you then didn't actually speak for a year. What was going on now as your adult self looking back, what was going on with that? What was happening inside you? Yeah, I think not only the trauma of experiencing her her death and, and being involved in such a jarring tragedy at such a young age, I think also trying to figure out, because at that point I had started to question what is reality and why do humans do the things that they do? And I had actually started researching quite a bit as a kid. And then here I was having a pretty traumatic experience and I had a lot of trauma before that. And so in that year, I was very internally trying to process what is the meaning of life? And, <laughs> and you were 15. And like, and I was 15. Yeah. 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 So, um, part of it was like, I just, as a kid, when you're a kid, you just think that you are invincible right? And at a very young age, here I am dealing with like, oh, wow, no, my decisions have actual consequences and death is real, right? So I was navigating all of that. I'll also just add though, now I see it like for sure it was a coping mechanism, but also I'm a very internal person. Like I don't need a lot of external stimulation, I have a whole world yeah. going on inside. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you do. <laughs> All the time. And that's very obvious from, you know, we haven't spent a ton of time together, but we've we've had the opportunity to be in person several times and and it's very clear that still waters run quite deep. Yeah. And that seems to be very related to your connection with spirit, connection with the unseen world. Okay, so you didn't speak for a year after your friend's death. And then I know that you have shared the next part of the story, which is to get out of the circumstances or to just change your circumstances that you were raised in, in that environment, it felt really important to go get an education. So at the coll collegiate level. Yeah. So what happened then? You were focused on getting to college and what happened while you were in, in school? Yeah, so college for me, I'm sure that if you look at most kids who come from um, poverty, we are told that, hey, if you wanna get out of this circumstance, there's only a few paths out, right? It's like, you're gonna be an athlete, you're gonna be a musician, or you're gonna get a college education. And there's a very small set of things that you can do in college to get out. So for me, going to college was number one, um, I'm not the most athletic person <laughs> and, uh, I do have some musical ability, but that was not, I was like, mm, th that doesn't seem like a safe bet, but I always have learned. I've been obsessed with learning comes very easy to me. I do it in my free time. I'm yeah. like that hardcore yeah. with the learning. So I get to college and by the time that I got to college, I was already experiencing, um, what we term the calling sickness. So, I was not well in my health, but also I was, I've always just been very determined and ambitious. So I get to college and 
my whole dream was like, I'm going to go to college. I didn't know what I wanted to do in college. I didn't really care actually. And I changed my major about umpteen times. I ended up deciding, okay, well, if you're going to go to college and you're smart, you, you go to you become a lawyer, an engineer, or a doctor. And I was good in science. So I, I'm going to become a doctor. And also I was like, well, but I've also been working because I've worked for a very long time and I've run businesses of different kinds. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, but as a fallback in case med school doesn't work, I'm going to um, also get a couple degrees in business. So I graduated wow. <laughs> all, all while working, by the way. So I was working full time in college, in college full time, ended up graduating with a degree in business and also a bachelor's degree in marketing management and also and my prereqs for med school. Wow. Also a baby. And I had my baby my my final year. I was a super senior. It took me a really long time yeah. to graduate because I was working. So I was in college for six years, which is... Because you met your husband really young, Yeah, right? Yeah, we met, uh, we were like 20. Yeah. So we've been together since, since and then. And you knew you wanted to start a family and there no, were some... No, no, no. No, tell me what happened there. No, no. I'm so I curious. I had this whole like sex in the city dream of like, I'm going to get out of my small town in West Virginia. I'm going to go live in the big city. And I'm like, going to I'm going to be a career woman. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to wait until I'm at least 30. And then I was like, when I'm 33, then I'll have a baby. Like I had it all wow. planned out. But then I met my husband. When you come from a small town, there's a different expectation of like what dating is like and what relationships are like. And I saw him and I was like, yep, I'm marrying this one. Because when you get a good one, you capture him. <laughs> you grab a hold and you don't yeah, let go. Yeah. Um, so I was like, well, okay, I'm going to, here's this great guy. Yeah. I don't need to do my dating thing. I wasn't that serious about it. Yeah. And um, I had a lot of health issues as going you were on. Saying, the, the calling sickness? The calling sickness, the but calling it sickness. was also manifesting as fertility issues. I was I was like in and out of the hospital with um, ruptured cysts and severe endometriosis and all of that. And my doctor, uh, my OBGYN, had been my mom's OBGYN, and she was his worst case that he had ever seen. Mm -hmm. And she had a hysterectomy in her early 30s. And so here I'm having all of these problems. And he was, he knew that we were engaged at that point. And he said, so listen, I wouldn't normally like say this, but I know that you're already in a serious relationship. And if you, if you all want to have kids, you probably want to get a start soon. You might have a five years, maybe. And so we decided since we were already engaged, like we'll go ahead and start trying. And I spent a, a solid year, um, in treatments, trying to get pregnant and, I'm grateful that I did that because I got my son, yeah. but it definitely sped up the timeline. For sure. By a decade. Well, yeah. So I am in awe of your capacity to complete several degrees at the same time as undergoing fertility medical treatment and then getting pregnant. I know you were also on bed rest for six months of that pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah studying on your own, figuring out all the pre-med stuff alone? Yeah. So it was my senior year. I was taking lots of pre-med um, prereqs. And this is kind of before online school was right. like a thing. There were a few online schools, but they were all kind of sketch. Um, so <laughs> I really was like, all right, I've got to figure this thing out. So while I was on bed rest, I was teaching myself physics and chemistry um, cause I was like, I am not going to sit here at home and have to prolong. Cause I had already been in college for years at this point and it was my last year. So I had lots of free time. And so I taught myself physics and chemistry. And then I had my son, uh, he came a little bit early. And then two weeks later after an emergency C-section, don't recommend this, went back, um, and completed all my finals that semester in school and of course did well, but the typical overachiever all my life, all your life. Yeah. In your family of origin, did you have models for going after something with that level of veracity and capacity 
in terms of like what you did with your academic career, you know, up until your bachelor's, which of course, like your learning has obviously continued, yeah. <laughs> but like more in a traditional sense, did you have models for that? Or did this capacity come from somewhere else? Or like, was it a trauma response? What was going on? Oh no, it was all a trauma response. It was all like a desperate attempt to not continue in the environment that I was growing up in. So this is not to, you know, downplay what was going on in my family. My mom was a single teen mom and worked two, sometimes three jobs, but it was all survival, right? And I witnessed that, was looking around. I mean, West Virginia, where I'm from, love the people there. The it, It's a beautiful place. And also consistently, it ranks in the top for everything bad, right? Like fentanyl deaths now, West Virginia's number one, obesity, depression, like just being in an environment where you're surrounded by all of that and racism, like racism was my daily experience. So I saw education as like, this is my way out. Yeah. And it was all really like coming from a place of, of survival. Yeah. Yeah. So you did all the pre-med recs. You finished your degree, you have this baby, and then did you go to medical school? So I because did Because I am aware you're not a doctor in the traditional sense. I am not a doctor. So I wonder what happened. <laughs> yeah, so what happened was um, he came and I had one semester left. Like I, I literally had him in November, did my finals, and then I had one semester left. Before he came, you know, when you're, when you're pregnant, you're like, you have so many ideas about what it's gonna be like to be a mom and you have no clue. How true. <laughs> no clue. Right. And so they actually come. And I had this experience because I had this emergency C-section and then, um, they sent me home. And a couple days later, a voice woke me up at like four o'clock in the morning and said, get up, get dressed, go to the hospital. Very calm, but very direct. And so I got up and went to the hospital and, um, I ended up with postpartum preeclampsia mm -hmm. And my blood pressure was sky high, like comatose levels. And I ended up spending five days in the hospital. And that was another moment where I had this realization that life is short, right? I'm having multiple of these experiences in my life. And here I am holding this baby. And I, I, I can't say for sure that it wasn't postpartum, but I for sure was crying every single day when he was born because I... I just knew that he was going to be my only one. And there was nothing that I wanted more than to be with him. Mm -hmm. And as I'm looking at the possibility of going to med school and the reality of what that looks like, I just knew that, well, I realized I was becoming, I, I just wanted the title of doctor so that others could be proud of me and that I could prove the statistics wrong and that I'm valuable and that I matter and all those things. That was really why I wanted to become a doctor, yeah. not because I actually wanted to be a doctor, right? And then the reality of it was I was going to be in school for four years, studying hardcore, and then a residency, and, and, and. And I was like, oh, he's going to be 10 years old before I even, like, get to know him. And mm. yeah, that, that would have been, like, a year ago. Yeah, Right. Yeah. And at this point, I'm like, I'm my son's person because I've been around the whole time and I've homeschooled him quite a bit out of that, that chunk. And we are very close, even though we're very different. And so I ended up working at Target. <laughs> like I went from pre-med, pre-med, three degrees doing all this or thing. whatever. Yeah. Well, I was overqualified when I graduated because I had all this experience in sales and marketing and yeah. management. And I had two degrees, magna cum laude. No one wanted to hire me. So I ended up working at Target as a manager. What was happening in your mind and in your thoughts when you just went through all of this and then that was where what you were doing? Yeah. Well, of course, I had a lot of judgment of myself for, oh, you have all this potential. And like you, all your, all your, all my friends off at med school, all my study group. And then here I am at Target yeah. and no offense to Target. No. Still love Target. Um, <laughs> but it was not 
the plan. But even with all of that, I kept coming back to what was true for me in that moment. What I, what was my genuine desire. And even then my genuine desire was like, I want to be at home. I want to be raising my son. And so I didn't stay at Target long and I ended up getting into my first direct sales company. I literally went to a, a party. So um, I used to sell for Pure Romance. Mm -hmm. I went to a party on Friday and I was like, oh, I could totally, I could totally do this. And bought my kit. And then on Monday, I put in my two weeks notice, don't do this. This is not smart. <laughs> None of this was smart. But I came home and told my husband, I was like, this is what I'm, I'm going to do this. And put in my two weeks notice because I just wanted, I was like, if I have to, you know, go do parties in the evening, but I can spend all day with my son because he was at that time one, right? He was sleeping yeah. by 7 p.m., yeah. right? That made sense to me. Wasn't the smartest way to go about it. But ultimately, that was my first, well, I almost failed, full transparency. Within the first 90 days, you kind of run out of friends and family. Right. So I had this moment where I had no parties on the books. There was no money coming in. I'm going to have to go find something. And I was like, no, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. I'm going to figure this out. So I got a mentor and I was like, listen, whatever you tell me to do, I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how uncomfortable it is. I don't care if you tell me to jump on one foot up and down, I will do it. And she said, okay, this is what you're going to do. Three steps. You're going to reach out to hundred people. You're going to get a hundred no's. But in that hundred no's, there's going to be some yeses, right? And then my book, my books were full after doing that within another six months, I was in the top of that company. That was another pivotal moment for me. What happened? So um, anyone who's been in direct sales, you know, once you get I to have. the top of the company, right? Right. We have that in common. Once you get to the top of, of these companies, you're winning prizes, you know, designer handbags, cash bonuses. I'm, I'm getting flewed out to <laughs> Vegas, you know, with my husband. And I looked at my life and I'm like, okay, I got the tall, dark, and handsome husband. You know, I'm like 23, 24. Tall, dark, and handsome husband. I've got the kid. I've got the quote unquote success that everyone tells me that I should want. And it's not even that I didn't like what I was doing. I, I actually yeah. did enjoy it, but it didn't feel like, it's like, this isn't what I was born for. Mm -hmm. I'm not living to my full potential. I'm still not really fulfilled. So I just started, I started asking different questions and I started exploring different spiritual systems more. And I started asking like, who am I? And like, why am I here? What is the meaning of, of this life? I know that it wasn't, it, it can't have just been to get married, have, have the kid and have the career. Cause here I am 24, 23. Right? Making really good money. Making good money. Which is like the goal for so many people. They think like once I get the marriage, the kid, the house, the income, Yep. then I'm squared away and I'll finally feel satisfied. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. <laughs> and I had a quarter life crisis, right? Like I discovered that early, which I'm so you grateful did? for. That's really early. Super early Yeah. to figure that out. Um, and then that's when some wild synchronicities like started coming into my life. And I just started following the breadcrumbs. What was the first breadcrumb or the most major one that sort of switched the trajectory? Yeah. So um, I'm having these conversations and all of a sudden I'm on Facebook and the people you may know popped up. And one of them was one of like my favorite professor oh. in college from Cameroon. And he was an older older man. And he was very against technology. So immediately I, I click add friend and send him a message. I'm like, what are you doing on Facebook? This is weird. And, um, he messaged me and he said, well, we had talked before and I had told him about my like remembrance of my past lives and so on and so forth. So he was like, well, you're not going to believe this. He said, well, first of all, he said, I'm an, another initiate, this other student in this school that I'm in recognized your last name. Come to find out she had ran track with my husband at a, at, in high school, at a school that was hundreds of miles away. 
Okay. He said, she actually created it. And I'm like, well, that's, well, number one, that's a weird coincidence, but also student. I'm like, you're in your seventies. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? Like what kind of school? He said, well, that's the other part. He said, remember how we were, you know, looking for this ancient Egyptian education and, and so on and so forth. He's like, I found one and we're going to be having this ceremony. Would love for you and your family to come. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm going to be there because this is some weird stuff that's popping up. Yeah. I'm super curious. So um, I made my family wear white <laughs> for the ceremony. Yeah. It was a fruit and honey ceremony. I was mm -hmm. like, I don't even know what that is. What does that even mean? Um, and so we pulled up and, and it was a house. And my husband's like, what is what in the world <laughs> have you got me going to? And I walked in the door. And as soon as I walked in the door and I'm, I'm like seeing all of these um, e ancient Egyptian deities around and I felt this knowing in my body, I was like, for the first time in my life, I know that I am in the right place at the right time. Whatever this is, this is where I am supposed to be at this exact moment. And that was my first introduction into um, the mystery schools. And I immediately joined that initiation, um, which was all started by um, a high priest from the Dogon tribe, which is in West Africa. A lot of people think ancient Egyptian spirituality is gone, but it it's just, it's African spirituality. The people who lived in Egypt were of different tribes and they traveled, they moved down as ancient Egypt was being conquered by Greeks first and then also by Arabs. And I think that was in the 700s they migrated and took the knowledge with them, but kept it in secrecy yeah. in the bush because yeah. you've got to do that. Um, that's the way to keep it safe. That's the way to keep it safe. And now we're in a time period where it's important for ancient wisdom to start coming back up. And my perspective through my initiations and through my experiences and part of my calling is how can we use ancient wisdom, not in a way where we, we're trying to go back to what our ancestors were doing, but how can we apply it as a methodology to navigate this life and to return our world back to some semblance yeah. of harmony with nature, but more importantly, maybe not more importantly, but with ourselves, yeah. aligning with our, our calling, who we are actually here to be in this life which is the same pulse as nature. Exactly. When people come to you, you know, you work with executives, high achievers, CEOs, you know, underneath your brand, the Royal Shaman, your business identity. When folks find you, what is a common thread that they're struggling with? There's a few that that pop up that are kind of like the the main things that that show up right now. Number 1, there's there's two types of leaders that are being born right now. There are leaders who got way where they are by adhering to the status quo, by following the quote unquote rules and the blueprint that was laid out. That would have been if you had gone to medical school. Exactly. Right. That that version of me. Absolutely. <laughs> that timeline over there. Uh -huh. Yeah. That version of me, but in other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then they get to, you know the C-suite, or they build the successful seven-figure business or six-figure business even. Um, it's not always a specific monetary amount, but they get there and they realize, oh, I thought that this was going to fulfill me. I thought this was going to be satisfying. I thought that this was going to give me purpose and it doesn't. And then they have an identity crisis because what have I been doing all this for? Who is this actually for? And that's one type of leader. The other type of leader that I'm also working with that that I'm currently coming up with ways to catalyze is the, we'll call them the, the heart-centered and or spiritual potential leader, mm -hmm. right? Who knows that they are called to make great change in the world, but maybe they haven't yet got clarity on, on what that is. And they have the, the thing that they have in common is that there are certain patterns, there are certain beliefs that we have about who we are supposed to be that have to be unpacked, 
that have to be reprogrammed in order for us to actually be our true self in this life and align our businesses, our money, our brands, our um, the work that we're doing in the world, align all of that in this grounded state of being. Let's say someone is in that place where they're like, okay, I checked off the boxes, maybe not every single one of them, but many of them. And I'm sensing a resonance in what Makosi is saying with your story about getting to the top of your direct selling company, with your mentioning of these leaders, these C-suite leaders who did, did the things. And it's like, oops, this, I didn't, this is not what folks said, right? Yeah. Like, and then you come in with your various lineage trainings, which of which you have many, you only mentioned one, but I know that's not the only one. Yeah. These ancient spiritual practices, these lineages of ancient wisdom that were then infusing, like how, why would it help me yeah. as a business owner <laughs> to, I mean, I know, I think I know the answer to this, but I really want to know what you have to say. Why is it relevant to bring in these ancient rituals, these practices, what you offer? How does that help me as a business owner if I already know that making more money is like not actually going to be the thing? There's a few reasons. From an, from a, we'll call it a shamanic perspective. There's a whole lot I can say just around that word, but We're we'll call back. it- a, <laughs> We're coming back. <laughs> we'll, we'll call it a shamanic perspective right. or a more nature-based perspective. Okay. Before we're born in this world, we, we make agreements about specific energies, specific frequencies that we are here to embody, that we are here to be. And when we don't embody them, we feel empty. We mm -hmm. feel unfulfilled. The challenge is, is that many of those frequencies that some of us are, are here to be are demonized or are not seen as valued or are seen as unworthy or less than, or you can't be that. I see this, especially with women. Um, there are some women right now who are called to lead. And let's say, for example, that your leadership requires for you to step into the aspect of you that is direct simple, right? Well, it seems simple, except that from the time that you came out of the womb as a little girl, you were told, don't be bossy. No one likes a, a, you know, a bossy girl and blah, 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 blah. But yet that's actually your energetic signature. You are here to be direct and you're here to challenge the way that people think. And so it's, I think that our, our ancestors understood that divinity expresses itself in a diverse way and that we need all of it. And the more that people, especially leaders at this moment, the more that we accept who we actually are and bring that through, Let's just use like a very tangible example, like your brand, right? There was a season where everyone had a pink brand. <laughs> Everything was pink with gold sacred geometry. No offense to anyone that has pink brand. Like that could actually be your thing, Absolutely. right? And if it is actually your thing, it is potent. Yes. Right? right. It is actually potent. Yes. However, everyone was just like kind of copying and pasting that. And we don't realize that we've done that like with our, with our whole lives, with our ways of being, with our ways of thinking, right? So I use nature as a teacher. She has so much to teach us and challenge us to be who we told her we would be mm -hmm. this time around. So what is a shaman? What is a shaman? Okay. So there's a lot of misunderstanding around what a shaman actually is, mainly because the way that we know and understand from the West is that we had some anthropologists who traveled specifically to Siberia, saw these kinds of medical people, 
medicine people, and they were called shamans, right? But they were understanding them from an outside lens. They didn't have cultural and contextual understanding. So the first thing is, is technically I'm not a shaman. So shaman is the title or the word that is used to describe a specific kind of healer from Siberia, right? But there are versions of that in pretty much every um, culture right. across the world going back in, you know, at least 100,000 years. And so I'm technically a, sing, what's called a Sangoma, which is a Zulu shaman. So I'm initiated in the Zulu lineage, but I'm also what's called a Sanusi. So a Sanusi has specific gifting around teaching and um, guiding others and, and so on and so forth. And when you come with this specific gift, it comes with other types of spiritual gifting. Um, so the one thing that I will say that shamans around the world have in common is our ability to work with trance states. And I think that part gets missed a lot yeah. because there are other types of healers. Not every kind of healer is a shaman um, and not every shaman is an herbalist because I know a lot of people think shaman automatically plant medicine. Um, in the lineage I'm initiated into, there are herbalists who study their entire lives and work with more like the physical aspect of the medicine and they ingest the medicine and so on and so forth. But then a Sangoma, which is like a Zulu shaman, it comes with an ancestral, it's an ancestral gifting. But then there are also other types of spirits that you can have that carry with them different, you know, types of gifts. But at the core, all of them have, all of the shamans at the core have this ability to work with trance states in a very specific way. And where is the second lineage you have trained in originated? So the, my, I'll just lay it out kind right. of timeline wise. <laughs> so the first, my first initiation was three years um, that was in an ancient Egyptian mystery school connected with the Dogon tribe of the of West Africa, right? So this is an ancient Egyptian lineage working with, with that realm. And you could say that that initiation was really back into myself. Mm -hmm. And that is similar to the work that I do now in, it's not structured at all the same way, but for sure in inviting people to let go of certain patterns, I have found that I've been initiating leaders into their calling and their gifts open up through the process. When we suppress certain aspects of ourselves, we also suppress gifts. Yes. That we come. We cannot suppress selectively. No, because we don't realize how much of ourselves we are suppressing, both quote unquote bad and good, right? Yeah. So first lineage, ancient Egyptian. Um, my second initiation, Zulu, right? And then I had a very short initiation with an indigenous Mexican um, shaman around uh, certain plant medicines. And then of course, because of who I'm here to be and my, my spirits, I'm being initiated constantly by spirit itself in the ways that it requires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why the royal shaman? So Makosi is not my name. Makosi is a title. So when we, um, in the, in a, the Zulu um, lineage, and this is a pretty common thing, when you are initiated, you are not technically a shaman until your community recognizes yes. you as such. So when you complete and you have your graduation ceremony, this is when you are now allowed to be called um, by certain titles. Now, usually um, in that lineage, you're called either Gogo or Mkulu, which means grandfather or grandmother. So you could call me Gogo or you could call me Mkulu because I actually have a, a masculine spirit, a masculine ancestor, and that makes it fine. Mm -hmm. um, but also there are some of us who have what are called royal spirits. So in our ancient cultures, we had pretty much a requirement 
at least what from what I've seen across the world, that your leaders were required to be like the most, the most spiritual. And I don't mean the most spiritual and like, they like looked spiritual and love and light. I mean, they were required and, and often tested. There were ways that the priests and the shamans, et cetera, would test someone's spiritual gifting and their spiritual connection. So um, in the Zulu, it's called having um, amakosi spirits, oh. royal spirits. They're usually associated with a lion. That's a pretty common one. And literally they were like the kings, the queens, the chiefs. So Makosi can be translated as either chief or king, because a queen's technically a slightly different thing. But okay. king, you would just call a woman a king, or the royal shaman. Mm. So that's where that comes from. That's I do amazing. also have um, an initiated name, but similar to a doctor, yeah. <laughs> you call them doctor. Right. Right. So that's why I'm called Makosi. I'm not the only Makosi. There are lots of Makosis. Cool. You speak a lot about money. Yes. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> we have that in common. We have that in common. We have a lot of things in common. <laughs> I want to know why do you see that it's important to put any attention on money Given that, we also know it's true that it's not really what it is that's going to bring us that sense of deep wholeness that we crave. What's From, it for then? Yeah, what's it for? What's I money mean, for? I mean, other than like paying your mortgage <laughs> and buying groceries. Like, I know we have to survive, you know, and in, in our economy requires those things. Okay, great. So, like, that's the literal. But then, like, on a spiritual level, what is money for? yeah. The reason why I started talking about money and, and why it's so important, especially right now, we're seeing a huge shift and we'll continue to see a shift over the next 20 years at least in our leadership, in the way that our systems are structured. Everything is falling apart and is a dumpster fire right now. And that's great news because it means while things are falling apart, it's time to build. We have mm. to build what we want to see. So the best way that we build, the best tool and resource to build the world that we want to see is money. And it allows for people who have a specific calling, right? Like you and I are sitting in a studio right now and it requires resources to take care of the people who are here supporting you. It takes resources to be in, in this building. It, you know, it takes resources. And for the people that are, well, I'll just tell you the spiritual insight because transparently I resisted talking about money because I'm like, that's not really the point. And so I go to spirit. I'm like, why are you all like, why do I have to talk about this? And why does this have to come up? When you talk to ancestors, they're, they always have real interesting personalities. And they're like, well, mainly because their descendants are sick of coming back to suffering. They're ready for a different reality. And our souls are ready for a different reality. Some of us have been here many times in really not great circumstances. And we've learned a lot in that. And now it's time for us to learn uh, a, a different experience. We're all just here to gather data and gain experiences. And our souls are ready for, for something different. And so we're going to see in the in this near future money is going to shift hands, but it's not going to be a, like someone's going to come down and save you and just like make it rain all over you. You have to open yourself up for it. You've got to understand what money actually is because money is really just a symbol of value and impact that you've created in the world. That's it. And also, I just have to add the perception of that because sometimes we think like, oh, if I don't have the money, then that means I'm not valuable. No, it's just that we have certain perceptions about what is 
what is valuable. And I think it's important for me as a spiritual teacher to embody for other spiritual people because it used to be that we we valued our spiritual connection so highly that our healers were the most taken care of. Yes. That our spiritual leaders were living in a very relaxed <laughs> way of life because of the level of responsibility. If you understand that your spiritual connection is the, the foundation for everything else, when your spiritual connection isn't in harmony, nothing else in your life really feels like it is, yeah. right? So I want to see, I want to see more money in the hands of people who are aware and who can, you know, invest in great causes and support others and treat people well, <laughs> you yes. know, like it doesn't, it shouldn't be that much to ask for, but also it, we have to allow ourselves to have it. Yeah. Can money be a healing agent? Oh, for sure. The other thing that I think I've, I've learned on this journey is like the spiritual journey can be experienced in any facet of life, right? Like I talk about business, but I also talk about money and healing your money stories, healing your relationship with money. I don't think we realize that who we are in one area shows up in other areas. So if, for example, we have like an anxious attachment yeah. to money, that's also showing up in other places, right? So money not only is a tool that we can use to, you know, invest and take care of ourselves and support others and all of those things, but also by healing our relationship with money, we can heal in so many aspects if you just deal with the root cause, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What has been one of the most important unlocks or shifts or breakthroughs for you around money in a spiritual context in your life? Mm. Because like, okay, I want to back up because I also want to ask you this question, but maybe it's the same answer. Okay. But feel free to answer two different ways. The second question is, <laughs> it's now 11 years later. Yeah. From that time when you were getting two degrees while nursing a baby, while like having your pre-med Rex, right? All of that. And you said that that was like from a survival instinct. It's now 11 years later. You are making a lot of money by any global standard. You are working like 15 hours a week. You are homeschooling your beautiful son. Like you are for sure living the dream. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> for sure. Like undoubtedly. Yes. And so I want to know... What was one key thing that unlocked that for you? Or just like, what's what can you deliver? What would you want to deliver past Makosi 11 years ago to say mm -hmm. now to, I mean, you did it already, so it sort of doesn't matter. <laughs> like to help anyone else who's living in survival mode mm -hmm. in overachievement from a trauma response to be able to still enjoy the fruits of their labor and this gorgeous life, but doing it from thriving in the way that you are no longer primarily in that trauma response, assuming that sometimes we go back and toggle, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would say that there's been two major shifts for me. The first one was in shifting that, you know what, I, I realized like I, I've built a level of self-trust and that self-trust looks like, I know that no matter what happens, I'm going to have my back. And I had, that took time, yeah. by the way, it took a lot of like me backing myself and me prioritizing myself and saying no to certain things. Um, and that built a level of self-trust, which I use now in my business where I get to create in my business and I get to put out offers because I'm like, you know what? Worst case scenario, this whole thing falls apart. I'm going to find a way, like I'm going to be fine. So now I get to create from a place not of needing, but from desire. Yeah. Like I just desire to impact people in a certain way. And I desire to connect with certain types of people and, and, and versus I 
need this to work or it ha I have to achieve and I have to, et cetera. And what's funny is the more that I've leaned into that frequency, the ease, the more easeful it is. I won't say it's easy because sometimes, sometimes, you know, this journey, the stuff that you navigate as an entrepreneur is such a personal development journey, a, such a spiritual growth process yeah. never that never ends, always challenging you. The other piece is specifically around money and it like completely shifted my relationship with money. Before I had this shift, my perception of money was very centered around myself. I can't charge that because, well, would I pay that? And oh, I'm only worth X, Y, Z. When I finally understood that money is just a symbol that people use to express how they perceive value, I was able to get out of other people's pockets mm -hmm. <laughs> and judging them for how they yes. spend their money and what they do with it. And then I was able to, to see, looking at my abilities and my gifts, I started understanding, oh, wait, like I don't value my gifts and genius that much because I have it, right? We don't value what we have as much as someone who doesn't have that, Yeah, right? It's why understanding genius and recognizing it is so important in yourself and in others. So from that place and from a more detached, less personal place, I just started asking questions like, okay, well, what kind of person would value these gifts? Not value me. It's not, it's not me, yeah. right? It's value that insight or value that ability. And then what value would they perceive that as, right? And that was, that made all the difference because I realized like, oh, wait, I had such a blessing to have this kind of awakening at 23, 24 years old that most people either don't have until they're very, very elderly or never have it. Yeah. Most people never have that understanding of the, of how to find your calling, of how to be in purpose, of, of how to find alignment, right? So then I started looking at, all right, well, that makes this extremely valuable, valuable. Yeah. to someone, yeah. right? And so I built my business just starting with who values that mm. the most. That's genius. Why not? It's a great strategy. <laughs> Why not? Killer strategy. <laughs> I Business love it. strategy right there. Who values yes. your genius the most? Not you, because that's where people get really yes. wrapped up. Because yes. if somebody says no to you, you then you, it's personal, right? Or if somebody isn't happy with what you do, then it's personal. You can take that out of it by just seeing your gifts as like a separate thing. You just hold them, mm -hmm. right? They're just... <laughs> I'm laughing because we had an inside joke um, inside of my one of my containers where we were talking about, just imagine that your gifts are in a ball, like a crystal ball, and your goal in this life is to allow people to touch your balls. Your balls. <laughs> just here to let people touch you our balls. I love that. Touch That's your balls. fantastic. <laughs> oh my God. So good. So good. Well, Cozy, oh. thank you for being here. Thank, thank you. you for who you are. I, I've i really never met anybody like you. And you're such a delight. Thank you such so much. Such a deep delight. So thank you for being here. Where can people connect with you if they want to know more and check out how maybe they can work with you? Yeah, the best uh, the best place these days is on Instagram or TikTok at The Royal Shaman um, or my website. And I also have a podcast called Euphoric Evolution, which mm. is on every major- Euphoric Evolution? Euphoric what a Evolution. great title. That's my methodology that mm. I've pulled and brought ancient wisdom. Um, it's really like a philosophy and a paradigm that people can use to live a more fulfilling, but also amazingly wealthy and abundant life. Incredible. And it's theroyalshaman.com as well as yes. at the Royal Shaman on the different On all platforms. the major platforms. Yep. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. Thank You're the you. best. This was so great. It was awesome. <laughs>